Hey guys, it's Jared Wesley here of Live Traders, and it is that time of the week. It's lecture time. This week, guys, we are going to talk about how professionals use proper trade and money management, but it's not quite what you might be thinking. All right, you think, oh, I already know money management. I take all my stop losses, Jared. Uh, I only risk a $50 or $100 or $500 of trade, and I never deviate from that. I know what I'm doing. It's not what today's lecture is about at all. We're going to start out by going over some basic money management for the brand new people, but then we're going to get into some high level experience type stuff about being more flexible with your trading, maybe giving them a little bit more room or areas that you can add back to your trades basically a way that you're not going to get stopped out as often and yet you're still going to have the same potential for winners now think about that imagine a way that you could get stopped out less often but still have the opportunity for the same size winners that sounds like a good plan to me so if you're interested in that then stick around guys if you like these videos come on man click that like button smash hammer that subscribe button guys i am jared wesley of live traders let's get to it this week's lecture topic is trade and money management for professionals what does that mean some of you are like well geez jared trade and money management i know what i'm doing here um i don't let stocks go past my stop loss i never risk more than my $10, $50, $500 limit, whatever my limit is, I never do those things. So this lecture is worthless to me. You're wrong because that's not what today's lecture is actually about. So you look at it and go trade and money management for professionals. Well, I have that under control. Today, we're going to change gears a little bit. Um, some of this is alluded to in professional trading strategies, um, but I want to maybe go in a little different direction today um, with this because I feel it's something that's helped me, especially in the last three to six months as I've been scalping more. And I think it's something that will help you guys as well. And you're gonna see multiple concepts that we're gonna discuss today. And I'm really hopeful that this is gonna be a topic that genuinely takes your trading to another level. And I thought it was appropriate earlier when Unmol was talking about what are some of the things that have helped and hurt you as traders. And one of the comments that I read in there was, Knowing I'm usually right, but sometimes my timing is off a little bit. So basically what the person is saying is, hey, the stocks I'm picking and the areas in which I'm picking them are generally correct, but I'm a little bit off here or a little bit off there. Well, we're going to talk about that today, right? You're going to hear the word flexibility uh, quite a bit. So let's dig in. No when will the insanity stop this week? Um, a couple just general basic comments, things to think about before we get started. Um, and then we're going to talk mostly charts. I think it's all charts. There was, there's one more text slide. Um, but size of your account, you know, experienced traders, you guys might use a percentage of your account size, right? This is basic stuff right here. So this isn't really what I'm going to get into in, in detail today, right? Experienced traders might use a percentage of their account, like half a percent risk. 1% risk, right? Maybe even as high as one and a half or 2% if you're scalping only. So you may have, for example, a $100,000 cash account and you might do 1% risk, $1,000, half a percent risk, $500. But new traders, it says news traders, that's nice. Kaz, are you in there? Kidding, I'm kidding, relax. But new traders use $5, okay? And that includes you, Olivia, also, because I got your email and you said you're risking $30. Why, right? You should just be risking $5 like all new traders because that's what you do. Um, you need to spend a couple weeks on paper, then go to very small risk and work their way up, okay? Um, this is a problem for most traders. You look at it and go, yeah, duh, of course, Jared, I know I should, but you don't understand my situation. Baby needs new shoes, blah, 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 blah. Just look, I'm not going to spend much time lecturing on this. Just do it, okay? If you can't even listen to that basic, simple advice, the rest of the lecture is going to be much harder for you to follow. Okay, if you can't listen to basic advice that new traders should risk very small amounts of money and you earn the right to raise your risk, then then trading is going to be a tough endeavor for you. Okay, don't let your ego answer this question. 
Okay, let your results answer this question. Frequency. Um, some trades may be very successful, but only happen rarely. You can overcome smaller risk levels with higher frequency. You don't have to have crazy risk levels. You know who's a good example of this, guys? Aaron. Aaron the original. You see him in the chat room. His risk level is not that high. I mean, it's it's decent. What is it, about three to 500 bucks, somewhere in that range? It's pretty good, but it's not crazy high. It's not like Cass who's coming in risking like two or three or $4,000 on a trade sometimes. But yet, but yet, he finds a way to come in and he makes, you know, 500, 1,000, 1,500 hours a day. I mean, the other day we saw him making 2,300 bucks. Um, so my point is, you can overcome a lower, smaller risk with a higher frequency. And he's out there taking six, seven trades a day for the most part, sometimes eight or nine trades. So if you're taking two trades a day, maybe keep your risk the same and up the frequency to three or four or five trades a day, assuming you can find those trades. But you don't have to have crazy risk levels to make good money. Okay, and then obviously the holy grail is when you can get up to a higher risk level and increase frequency and all of a sudden you're at five, six, seven trades a day with, with a higher risk level, okay? Um, experience level, once traders are beyond the point of discipline problems, larger risk amounts are less dangerous, why? Because there's no risk of you going off the reservation. There's no risk of you doing something really, really stupid. See, you have to look at this and, and it's probably something you guys don't write down, but look at how frequently you make a, what I would call big mistake. For example, you work your ass off and Monday to Thursday you do really well and Friday give your whole weeks back. Somebody made that comment as well when Unmall was asking about what are some of your problems and somebody made the comment about large losses. Well, you might be okay 80 to 90% of the time, but that 10 or 20% of the time wipes out the 80 to 90%. You still have a discipline problem. Once you get past that, okay, once you get past that, you can start risking larger amounts of money because you don't have to worry about the discipline. Now, obviously, you still need to prove success. You shouldn't just, hey, I'm disciplined, I'm gonna raise risk. Well, if you're not profitable, then you haven't earned that right yet. Um, and do not make risk or R unit decisions during the trading day. That's duh. And I know it's an obvious one, but people do it all the time. There's no such thing as a great play beyond how great is defined in a plan. And you don't just change your trading plan because it's 1030 on a Thursday and you're like, well, that looks like an unbelievable trade. I'm gonna raise my risk, right? The idiot always thinks things are great in the heat of battle right? It's like Kobe saying, I never saw a shot I didn't like. Well, they are all great shots though. You know what I mean? So don't let your idiot trade for you. This is very basic stuff. Very basic. It's just a refresher. The rest of the lecture is not going to be on really any of this, but I wanted to get this out of the way because I don't think it can hurt spending five minutes talking about all the things that you need to do to rehash and refresh your memory because sometimes we get ahead of ourselves and we realize we're doing things we shouldn't be doing. Okay, but the rest of today, not going to be much about anything I just talked about right now. Okay, so some of you have seen this slide, right? Professional Trading Strategies has a slide similar to this. And it's something that I'm finding you guys are getting, let's just, what's the best way I can put it? Your hand is getting caught in the cookie jar a little too much, a little too frequently, a little too often when you're scalping. Okay, um, so R as a fixed amount, how do you usually trade, tight or flexible? Um, it's a great question because there's actually no right or wrong answer to this. It's more a personal opinion, but some people are wrong about how they're applying it. Right? You know how when we talk, guys, we talk about, when you talk about trade and money management, we talk about kind of those four things. We talk about um, financial constraints, time constraints, personality constraints, and intangibles, right? That's right out of professional trading trade. We have those four things we talk about, time constraints, personality constraints, financial constraints, and then intangibles. So there's no wrong answer here, but where you could be wrong is how you're matching those four things to how you're actually trading. That's an important key here. For example, if you're trading in a way that doesn't match your personality, you're gonna have a hard time. If you're trading in a way that doesn't match your time constraints, 
you're going to have a hard time. It's like saying, hey, I have an hour a day to trade, but I'm going to use 60-minute charts, 30-minute charts, 15-minute charts. Well, you're going to have a very hard, challenging time if you only have an hour to trade, but you're using 15-minute charts or 30-minute charts. You just don't have a, that much time to let your trades materialize. You're going to have a very hard time if you're shooting for large targets on a higher time frame when you have a jittery personality and an hour to trade. Do you see where I'm going with this? So you look, for example, at Stefan, Stefan, right? I don't know about you guys, but if you've noticed how he trades, he is a tight, tight trader. You guys see, here's the problem. Some of you might think, wow, but he, he shoots for 4R, Jared. What do you mean? Watch his trades. He was taking AMD today with like a 30 or 40 cent stop loss. You know how hard it is to trade AMD with a 40 cent stop loss? It's very challenging. And you're going to get dinged once in a while. But he goes to break even after 1R. So to him, he's like, well, if I can get a quick 1R, I can get to break even first, and then I'll hold for that 4R target. And that's one way, one style of trading. But as Jordan is commenting now, not to mention buying power constraints. I saw you guys take Apple the other day with a 25 cent stop. It's a freaking $175, $180 stock. Do you know the kind of buy, if you're doing 1%, let's say you have a $100,000 account and you're doing 1% risk, 1% risk, okay? And you have a 25 cent stop loss. Well, let's type it in. 1,000 divided by 0.25, you need 4,000 shares. We'll multiply that by, what's Apple, $177. You need $708,000, $708,000 to trade that stock, not the option, the stock. If you're trading the option, you can get away with it. If you have a $100,000 account, you're risking 1%, you only have $400,000 in buying power. You can't actually take that trade with 1%, with 1%. You might be able to take a half a percent, maybe two thirds of a percent, but 1% is off the table, okay? Exactly. To see, well, you're getting the point though, Jordan, that, that you're, which you usually do. I'm talking about how you need to balance your trading here. So we're not even into what my main topic is yet, by the way, okay? But you need to look at things and go, you know, I would really like to trade like Stefan does, but I can't do that with 1% risk. It's an impossibility unless you're doing the option or taking a half a percent risk and only taking one trade at a time. Stefan is rarely in two trades at a time. It's usually one trade at a time. But many, not all, not all, many of his trades, you simply cannot do 1% risk on. The stop loss is too tight with how, with the given the size of the stock, um, and it's too expensive to do that. So you have to cut your risk to a half a percent. But you might make up for it with frequency, maybe, maybe. Or you might choose to say, I really like those trades. I prefer to take the option on that instead of the stock, and therefore it's okay. I can still get that level of risk. So there's lots of things or considerations before you take these trades. Okay, um, so. That's one thing. Are you a tight trader? Are you a flexible trader? You see, today I'm going to talk about flexibility, right? Let's say hypothetically the entry on this trade is $30 and the tight stop loss is 20 cents. The semi-tight stop loss is 30 cents. The wide stop is 40 and the big stop is 60. I think there is a preponderance from traders to immediately go to the tightest or close to the tightest possible chart stop they can find. I'll go to the next slide here for a second, right? Being a flexible trader, okay? New traders often do not realize the importance of initial share size, okay? Whoops, this should be five, all right? Move that away. Okay, sorry about that, all right? Um, all right. So new traders often do not realize the importance of initial share size and just take a fixed share size, which leads to crazy money swings. So if you're brand new, you might say, well, I take 500 shares on every trade. Well, that's crazy. 500 shares on Tesla is not the same as 500 shares on SQ. It's just not. So I want you to get out of the mindset of the fixed share size. Let's throw that out the window. I'm not even going to spend much time on it. Okay. At the next level, Traders set share size based on the strategy stop. Okay, that's fine so far. 
and often set it as tight as possible. So you have level one here, which is like, I'm brand new, I take 500 shares on everything. Well, that's insane because that risk level could be all over the place. We don't ever do that. Next level is traders set a share size based on the strategy, the bottom of the base, at the bottom of the buy setup, right? And often they set it right a penny below that, right? And if you look at professional trading strategies, we talk about, hey, put your stop one or two pennies below this area, okay? So part of that is right out of the beginning of the book. So for example, if you take 2,500 shares on this buy setup using the entry bar, okay, your risk is now locked into the chart at that stop and must be adhered to. You can now say your risk is $500 and also your risk is 20 cents on the chart. You're all in, that's it. If you choose that, okay, you're all in. It's the least flexible stop potentially the highest risk reward. And this is the balance that we're gonna to discuss today. And this balance also has a lot to do with the type of patterns you are trading. When you are taking double bottom retests, they are not decisive areas in meaning to the penny type areas. We always talk about support and resistance being an area. It's not an exact penny. You can have a stock go 30 cents below that pivot low and still be a valid double bottom retest in a really, really good area to buy the stock. But if you're not willing to give it wiggle room, you're gonna have a stock that you're likely right on the idea, but you get stopped out anyway on, okay? So I am not a big fan of the tightest stop loss, okay? I'm not a big fan of that. Now, if you go here, so, now, if we go 40 cents, you can now say your risk is still $500. That hasn't changed, that's good news. But your risk is 40 cents on the chart. You are still all in at that level. That's the key, at that level. But you could add shares, you could add shares, if at some point you decided to bring your stop up to one of the prior levels. The prior level is 20 cents and 30 cents, okay? This provides you with flexibility. There's nothing worse than being right, but not getting paid for it or even losing from it. This is something that I've been doing pretty much every day since I've been scalping, right? The last, we've been scalping since May or so, May, June, July, we're in August now. I'm giving them all the room and I'm not telling you guys where you should place your stop because I see a lot of people take my trades and they just use a different stop loss, and that's fine, okay? But there are times where you would stop out, okay? And CVNA today is a great example of that. If I used the tightest stop on the chart, which was like 42.75, we would have been tagged. It went down to 42.42. I ended up getting out for a small gain on a stock I should have possibly lost on if I used the tightest available stop. But there are other times like Caterpillar where it just hits and runs. Like it just, it literally hits and runs, okay? And it goes a dollar and if I used my stop, that dollar probably would have been maybe a half hour, three quarter hour gain. But if you used the tighter stop, you would have had maybe a one and a half hour gain. Double the gain, but I'm okay. I would rather win more, but win less than win less and, win, and, and make them bigger. Does that make sense? But that's a stylistic approach. So I'm winning now 90% of the time, 85% of the time, but the winners are smaller. Instead of winning 50% of the time with bigger winners, I found that to be better because I like the flexibility because again, we're rarely wrong. We're wrong sometimes, no doubt about it, like UPST. We're wrong sometimes, just flat wrong. But I'd rather have the flexibility than not have the flexibility. So let's take a look, okay? You guys remember this chart, okay? This is a stock that went lower into the 50 MA at support, that 10 minute pulled back and you saw the double bottom retest. Now, you could have just put your stop at 
the green line at 62.25, wherever it was, and bought it at 62.50 and used a 25 or 30 cent stop. And it popped up 50 cents initially, and then obviously a lot more later, $2. That's fine. That's fine. I'm not that person. My stop, my stop's gonna be way down here, okay? Why? Because these are areas. And if I see that 50 MA and it breaks it by 10 cents, I don't want to be tagged out by 10 cents. So I'm probably going to give this thing, if I'm in at 62.50, I'm going to give it at least 50 cents, maybe even more. Maybe even more. I, if I recall, I think the stop of this was like 61.90. It's a 60 cent stop with the potential of a 50 cent gain. So it's not even one to one. And I said, let's shoot for 30 to 50 cents. I'm okay taking that half R, three quarter R. And then there's a possibility to add back or take a new trade. And let's say you take a new trade. The new trade's at $63. Could you put your stop loss at $62.70? Yes, you could. You could. And that's okay. Or you could put your stop loss at the low of the day at $62.25. Now you have a $0.75 cent stop loss. Now, clearly, this has a lot of room to go higher, 64.25. And in this case, you still could have gotten 2R. But if you used a tight 30 cent stop, you could have had 5R. But there was a much higher chance you get shaken out and then it goes back up. So there's different approaches. You could literally say, okay, if I get shaken out, I'll get back in it. We'll talk about that in a few more minutes. That's fine too. So again, as you know, John is saying, every style has pros and cons. And that is true. You need to find out the style you're most comfortable with, but make sure you're being objective about it. Make sure you're telling yourself, you know, this is a double bottom retest at daily support in a 50 MA. I know that this is not an exact penny. I know it. This double bottom is not an exact penny. This stock could literally peekaboo to 62.60, break that low, and then go higher later. Okay. I don't want to be shaken out of that right? So it's up to you how much room you want to give it. But one of the things you should consider here is the type of trade you're taking, right? Breakouts should hit and run. Three bar plays should hit and run. But every once in a while, we see the computers have some fun. Peep a kaboo, pop, drop, pop, pop, drop, pop. Are you fast enough to take the stop and get immediately back in it? If so, then keep the tight stop if you want. Or do you want to give it enough room that you're not going to get taken out on the shake? Okay, it just, it really depends on your style. So give yourself choices is my take on things. Take half the stop, or uh, sorry, take the half loss at the chart stop maybe, okay? Or hold on to it. So if your view has changed about the trade to make it lower odds or less relative strength or relative weakness, if the market has made a strong move op in the opposite, strong, made a strong move opposite direction of your trade, wow. There, whew, man, that was a tough one. My English is getting bad. If the market has made a strong move in the opposite direction of your trade, you might look at this and go, you know, this isn't what I thought it was. Great example, CVNA. I got in and I found out that I overlooked something. What I overlooked was how it got there. Where it was wasn't the problem, right? Where we were on the chart for CVNA wasn't the problem. But how we got there ended up being an issue. The other issue was the market is just relentless today. It's just not bouncing. So things changed. So I added a little where I wanted to. And as soon as I got back to break even, I walked away. And thankfully we did because it dropped another dollar fifty. It was the right move because things changed. New information changed as well as the fact that I missed something. So it was a double, double whammy. I missed something and I did recognize it. And then the market changed. So it was the smart thing to do to walk away. Right? You could also let it go you know, to the full loss at the wider stop. You know, if either of the above isn't true. If in doubt, default to this option 90% of the time. So if you're looking for the wider stop, and none of these things are happening, maybe if your view has changed or if the market is made strong. And guys, I'm not lying here, I'm, I'm being honest. What happened in CVNA was just coincidence. The fact that I wrote these yesterday and that happened today is pretty damn unusual, right? My view of the trade changed and the market went completely against us, had almost no bounce in it. So it's just coincidence that happened. But 
we had what? The wider stop loss. So the wider stop loss saved us. And I only made, or I think I lost $10 on the trade, right? The wider stop loss saved us. So with the wider stop, you can always add back later. The 20 cent stop loss gets tagged. The 40 cent stop loss, you're still in it. And let's be honest, if it pulls back to this area, does it mean it's completely done and over and finished? No, right? No, not at all. What you really don't want to see is it break this pivot down here. Let's put a pivot there. What you don't want to see is it break, break that pivot, right? That's what you don't want to see. Okay, now, do I recommend you putting your stop loss way down there? No, because your risk to reward will be so terrible, it's going to be hard to make money. You're never going to stop out, not never, but very rarely stop out. But see, if you have the stop somewhere in the middle, give it the pivot plus room, now you have some flexibility. And the other thing to consider is adding back to a trade in this area right here, right? See this 20 cent stop? If you start seeing a bottoming tail, you start seeing a volume spike, maybe make that an ad point. But these are all things you should know before you take the trade, right? And that's something, for example, that I did with CVNA. I said to you guys, the stop is 42.75. And very shortly after that, I said, I'm willing to give CVNA down to $42 if need be, right? So I, I called the trade and less than a minute later, I said, guys, I'm willing to give this down to $42 because this is what I'm doing. I'm giving it the wide space, knowing I'm probably going to get an opportunity to add back, okay? probably going to get an opportunity to add back. So then you take a look at this, you ask yourself, okay, we talked about this stock last week, right? The failure of the sell setup confirms the buy setup, right? The failure of the sell setup also changes the micro time frame downtrend, right? So if we did this, right? Granted, it's on a, a micro time frame, but if we did that, and we made this orange. Let's make it super, super wide. Um, whoops, wrong spot. Let's do that. That's a little micro trend line, right? See the orange line there? We just failed on the sell setup, broke the trend line. So now you have to start thinking about being bullish. So now as it's bouncing, you're saying, gosh, a pullback to the newly formed support, no longer resistance, the ceiling becomes the floor, right out of the book. Ceiling becomes the floor, break into the trend line, kind of retest this high. The only thing better would have been a higher high. That's the only thing that would have been better would have been a higher high. But anyway, pulls back to newly formed support and you're going, that's a great entry, but this is still an area. 316 is an area. So do I want to give it the tightest possible stop on the chart, 317 by 316? You could. It tested it and bounced. It tested it, should bounce. But in my case, I'm going to want to give it a little more room. I'm going to give it down to 315. The target is roughly 319. So you still have one to one in the target. Someone else might go, yeah, well, I don't want one to one. I want two to one at the target. But now we're expecting expecting this pivot to be broken because we're in a newly formed uptrend. We're not quite in an uptrend, but we're in the transition period. So you have to take a look at the chart and go, what is likely to happen, but what could happen? See, we always look at a trade and go, well, it's in a stage two uptrend. So higher highs and higher lows, higher highs and higher lows, right? And that's what's likely to happen. But there's also the, what could happen is, the market could get weak out of nowhere, a news report could come in, a 10 a.m. reversal time could happen, and all of a sudden, Meta breaks that low, but it's still the same strong stock. It's still the same strong stock. You know what's a great example of that today? It was SQ, right? SQ, the market was going lower, and SQ was just jonesing to break out higher, but the market wouldn't let it. And I kept saying to you guys, I really like this idea. I really like this idea. Look how well it's holding up to the market while the market's puking out, SQ's holding near the highs. So all we need is a five minute bounce in the market. Why is that important? It's important because it allows me to objectively give SQ more room as long as, and this is always true, as long as I have not exceeded my money management. If your risk is $100 and you're below $100, you need to be out of that trade. 
period. But if you don't, and you have, say, your, your risk is only $50 at that point, you have $50 of flexibility there to add back to SQ, give it a wider stop. And that's exactly what I did on SQ, and it's exactly what I did on CVNA. I started with a smaller position. It went against me. I added, I added, I added three times to it. Got my cost average down and eventually got out of it. But when you look at something like SQ, it gave the opportunity to add back and then continue to tighten our stop loss. So ultimately, we ended up having almost a full lot on that, and it did exactly what we wanted it to do. So I'm a proponent of giving them a little more wiggle room, especially when there's something like this meta trade or like the SQ trade we took earlier because it showed so much potential, so much. I mean, guys, the market was puking and SQ's holding you know, the upper 20% of the day. That's exactly what I wanna see. It's gonna take a serious market event for SQ to die, right? So that's how you have to look at these things. I hope, I hope that that's making sense because in my mind, it's crystal. It's like so crystal. All right, now, remember this one? We talked about this one last week as well, Johnson & Johnson. What do we have? A stock that gapped down to support. That green line is support. All right, there's a 200 period moving average there. Stock should hold that area, give or take, that area. What do we have? Bottoming tail, bottoming tail, bottoming tail, bottoming tail, bottoming tail. Well, stock is wanting to go higher here. It's looking to go higher. The question is, where do you get in? And when you get in, what's your stop loss? Well, we have a sell setup failure. That's a good spot to get in, right after the sell setup failure. The bottoming tail has already proved strength. The sellers were unable to have an impact on the buyers, so much so that the sell setup failed. You're also at daily support near the daily 200 MS or uh, 200 moving average, relative strength to the market. So in this case, you might say. This area right here, which is 166, I'm good. I'm good. Why? Because you're getting in at 166.70, right? It really shouldn't break 166.50. I mean, you could put your stop loss at 166.50. That would be an acceptable area on the chart. You could say, well, it shouldn't break 166.50, but I want to give it 20 more cents. I'll give it 166.30, and that's fine too. Or you could say, you know what? If it breaks this green line, I want nothing to do with this stock, nothing. It bounced four or five times here. I'll make a small ad just above that area, but if it breaks that area by more than five or 10 cents, I don't wanna be in it. But that's the 70 cent stock. And your target is the red line, 167.50. So you only have about 70 cents. So I look at it and go, well, if I have 70 cents to the target area, why not give it the wide stop? Why not give it the wide stop and try to get 50, 60 cents out of it? Because if it does wiggle, it did not wiggle, by the way. It didn't. It just kind of hit, slight pullback and just rip. If it does wiggle, I'll just add to it and I'll make more money at the target. But the full risk is the 70 cent stop. So if you do get 50 or 60 cents, you're still getting a full winner. But if you get an opportunity to add, you can either get out sooner with the same amount of money or hold it to the original target and make more money, okay? Does that make sense? I hope so. I don't wanna like talk too fast to where you, know, you guys are confused. Usually I talk too slow to be honest with you. Um, but anyway, it's just, you just have so much more flexibility. You're not gonna stop out as much. You're gonna stay in trades longer. Here's another example of a stock that's changing trend. You have a failure of a sell setup right here, right? Fails to sell setup. So you're looking at possibly getting in here because you're breaking above 438, okay? It's a little above that area, right? So you're looking at a buy opportunity. Well, you could put your stop at 436. You could put your stop at like 435. Or you could just put low of the day, which is very wide. You're looking at like a $7 stop loss. You could pick anywhere in the middle. The fact is, it really shouldn't break 436. And it really, really shouldn't break 435. So for me, I'd be looking at 438, probably by 435, right there, right? It's like 435.50 right here. And I'd probably be looking at a 438 entry, okay? Something like that. And this stock ultimately went, I don't know, five or $6, okay? Um, but that single trade um, made you profitable for the year or the rest of the thousands of trades or you, 
I don't know what you're saying, Val, but that single trade made you profitable for the year or the rest of thousands of trades you take every day. I, I honestly have no idea. I'm trying to decipher what you said, but if you could just maybe clarify or retype that. Um, can you clarify when it would be acceptable to take less than an R? Are you mean as your target? Every day, all day. You can take less than an R if you want. It's just depending on your expectation, right? You have to bat 90% to make that work, right? I mean, Unwall is a great example of that. I mean, UPST is one of the worst losses I've seen him take in a long time. I think you guys lost like a dollar sixty-five, right? A dollar sixty-five on on that. That's that's a massive loss for Unmol. Like that's as big of a loss as I've seen him take. Um, but it's one of the few losses I've seen him take. Does that make sense? Um, so he comes in and, you know, he makes money 90 to 95% of the time, right? And today was just an unusual circumstance. I think he lost on two trades. Losing 20 cents on ARC, not a big deal. You know, Tesla, he made 50 cents on the Tesla puts, you know. Um, so it's just one of those things that you have to balance out. Does that make sense? So, yeah, once in a while you may take a... A one to three loss? Possibly. I'm trying not to do that. Does that make sense? What I'm showing you today isn't that. Let me repeat myself. What I'm showing you today isn't that. Okay? If I lose, I might take a, a one to two loss. That happens. But I'm trying to stay away from three, four, five to one losses. Right? One to four, one to five. Does that make sense? I did a lecture a month or two ago saying, hey, it's acceptable up to, you know, one to five, but I, I don't want to do that. I don't really ever want to do that. Um, so the goal here is if you lose, make sure it's no more than double. That's the goal. Every once in a while, it may be a little bit more than that. But most of the time, you should be winning, getting at least a half R to an R, um, and you should be batting 80, 90 plus percent doing that right? Because you're being flexible. And when they get down to some of those areas, you're adding back. So it lowers your cost average and you can get out a little bit earlier or so, so to speak. Okay. Sometimes guys getting out of a stock at break even is the best thing that you ever do, right? It avoids taking a loss. The other thing is taking a small loss. Like you'll see Aaron do that quite a bit. Oh, I took a 10 cent loss. Okay. No big deal. And then he takes a 40 cent winner on something. Okay, and that's another good way of giving them extra room and then the objectivity to say, you know what, it's probably not going to work. Let me take that quarter hour loss. You can bounce back from that very quickly. All right. Same thing here on this, right? We talked about this last week. 492 support. This is a decent entry right here at 494. See that entry at 494 right there? Probably should have put an arrow on it. Let me do that for a second. Um, hold on one second, guys. Right? So that area right there, that's a decent entry. Okay? Decent entry. But it could break below 492 because it did earlier, and this pivots over here. You can see also on the 15-minute, the pink line, it might go down to 490. So when you're taking this at 494, you have to give that some thought. Go, you know, I know $4 is a wide stop, but it is Adobe. And 494 to the high of the day, you have two targets here. You have 496 and you have the high of the day. Those are the two targets, 496, which is a half R. And then the high of the day is like 499-ish. That's $5. That's more than an R. For me, I'd rather give it down there and take the $2 from it. Take the half hour and walk away. Some other people go, I'm going to give it $2.50. I'm going to give it $4.91.50 right under that pivot, $2.50. I'm going to get almost an R to the first pivot. And to get to the second one, I'm going to get two to one. And that's okay if you want to trade that way. Okay. But guys also, and I know it wasn't a big shake, but do you see this at $500? Do you see the shake and bake? Peekaboo topping tail breaks below the base. The tight stops all got tagged right there. Okay. You see this right here. Peekaboo over 500. All the tight stops just got tagged by a dime, and then the stock rips higher. 
like literally rips from 498 to 503, five dollars higher in the next nine minutes, 12 minutes. I don't want to be in that shake, right? Take it at 500. I'm going to give it some more room, and then if that happens, I'm adding back all day long, baby. If that shake happens and it comes back to my entry point or before the entry point. I'm adding back, raising my stop up because it should not break that bottoming tail now. That's what flexibility gives you. Sure, you're going to give up some money on some trades, right? The trades that just hit and run, you're going to give up some money, okay? So be a smart trader, guys. Flexibility keeps you in the trade, right? Most traders confuse high reward to risk setups with tight stops. You do, right? Years ago, guys, stocks traded with spreads, an eighth, a quarter, three eighths. They called them teenies right at one point half i mean you guys don't remember that but late 90s trades that you know we didn't have decimals they traded in fractions right do kids even know what fractions are these days um but my point is is that was the smallest you could get an eighth a quarter right 25 cent spreads so to think that we can have stops that are relevant into a penny Whoa, now fractions are they them. <laughs> oh, you're killing me, Jordan. Now they have micro lots, right? They don't even have pennies. They have micro lots now, right? Um, but my point I'm making is we can't be that specific sometimes. Got to give it some flexibility. Thinking that any support area discussed will hold to a penny is flawed thinking. It's true. It's flawed. They're areas. We talk about it all the time. You know, AI high frequency trading has accentuated this issue if there was any doubt. I mean, we just saw it on the last chart, the last slide. Things happen, they bust you up by a nickel or a dime and you're like, son of a gun, and then you watch it go. Tell me that hasn't happened to you before. It's happened to me before. It's happening to a lot of you. See, sometimes, see, there's a lot of folks that don't type in the chat room, right? That don't comment, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. So the people that do type, I sometimes tend to think that's the normal average person in the chat room, and it's not. There's a lot of you out there that think that support and resistance is held by a penny, and if it breaks by a nickel, all of a sudden it's no longer support. Bullshit. It could still be great support. Just because it broke it by a dime doesn't mean anything, right? So most trades that stop out soon, most trades that stop out stop soon, right, after the entry okay that's generally true think about giving them room right here is step one of take high share size to target and low share size to stops think about that that's step one to getting to that because think about it if it immediately goes against you you don't have big share size you have small share size because you gave it the wide stop if it does take out that second area, third area, you still have an opportunity to stay in it and add back to it and increase your shares and raise your stop, okay? So it's just one of those things that the flexibility is teaching you more about price action of the stock, keeping you in it longer. Now, occasionally you're gonna give up the bigger gain, but if the stock does go against you, you can get full on it now when it does come back up, right? I'll go back to it real quick. Whoops, wrong chart. There it is, my bad. That breakout is a prime example of what I'm talking about. It's like a perfect example of it. Now you can get full and you can even add if you want in the middle of that base and raise your stop. So you could, for example, you get in at 500, you're giving it like 496, 497. It shakes out, you add a little on the bottoming tail, just a little, maybe a quarter, and then when it breaks 500, you get full, full. And now your stop loss is right under it. So it's like 497.75, you are full, full. Now you have a $2.25 stop loss and a cost average that's better than 500. It's better than, because you add it on that little bottoming tail also. And it goes $3 and you do well on it, okay? Most traders are going to experience fewer stops by doing this. How often have you stopped by pennies only to see the stock then go to your target? Probably a lot, too often. And as we all know, it's been a while since I've talked about it, since I've mentioned it. We all know how often the second try works. Did someone say 
84% rule? We haven't talked about that in a while. So I'm not telling you you have to do this, right? I'm not telling you you have to do this. I'm simply saying more flexibility usually does a couple things. It keeps you in the trade longer. It gives you fewer stop outs and you learn a lot more about price action. You always always wonder why is Unmall so accurate? Why is, you know, Jordan so accurate? Why is, um, you know, Aaron or Cass so accurate? Because they are very in tune with price action. There are certain times you see a stock and you just know, like SQ this morning, I saw the relative strength of SQ. I'm looking at it like, this would be very unusual if this didn't work. Like highly unusual if this didn't work. And then you take other trades like CVNA and you're like, yeah, this is not my best effort. But there's other trades where the market's going against you and you're like, no, this thing wants to explode. I can't wait for a five minute bounce in the market. You know, um, so anyway, I hope that you guys learned a little bit about being more flexible, right? And not always using the tightest stop. I'm not saying that you can't trade with a tight stop loss. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel for you. I'm trying to give you an opportunity to stop out less often, still make decent money and understand that support and resistance are areas that if you're thinking or expecting it to hold by a penny, you're sorely mistaken. Now, as I said earlier and alluded to, there are some, right? There are some patterns that are hit and run patterns and shouldn't shake out, but sometimes they do, right? And another thing you might want to consider, and I haven't talked about this in a while also, is a back test. And go look at your last 100 stopouts. 50 stopouts, 100 stopouts, and ask yourself, if you had given it more room, 10 cents, 50 cents, a dollar more, how many fewer stopouts would you have had? And would it have made a bigger impact on your PL? It's something you can actually go back and test. All right. These are the these are the things that matter if you're going to call yourself a professional trader. It's a business. If you're not grinding every day to make your business better, you're doing something wrong. Like complacency is a real thing. Wake up, do the same thing. Wake up, do the same thing. Well, if you're making a lot of money, fine, keep doing that. But if you're not fine tuning your approach, then you're wasting time. So I don't want you to go rip up your trading. That's not what I'm saying, but I am saying these are areas that you likely can improve upon and you can do so by testing it or back testing it, et cetera. And then all of a sudden you might be able to add 10 or 20 percent or maybe more to your profitability just over a small but meaningful adjustment. I do believe that many of you are just in autopilot. You know, you're just on autopilot every day. You just come in. Oh, I scanned my gap list. We'll see what Jared has today. Blah, blah, blah. OK, you're not getting better. You just think that by looking at more charts, you'll just get better. Now, you will get better by doing that, but you need to break down those charts. You need to have a purpose to what you're doing. It's like going to the driving range. You don't just go hit balls. You'll spray them left and spray them right. You'll get onto the golf course and you'll be like, well, why is everything out of bounds? Well, because the driving range is freaking 100 meters wide, 100 yards wide. The fairway isn't. And that's what a lot of traders do. They don't have a specific focus, goal, and purpose each and every day. It's, that, it's going to take some effort. But if you want it, it's there for you. And I'm telling you, spending some time at jury duty was an eye-opening experience listening what people do for a living and where they're at in life. Wow. Trust me. You will be unique and different if you put the time and effort into this. All right? I say it to you all the time and you don't want to believe me, but I'm telling you, just trust me on it. Successful people are different. They think different, they act different, they do different, they are different. They're different. You don't want to believe it. All the broke people out there are like, no, 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 they're just lucky. They're not just lucky. They have a very specific purpose each and every day. They wake up and they have a plan. They wake up and they have goals that they're going to accomplish that day. And they don't give up on them. 
they are different, okay? And you have to be accountable to yourself. And if you need someone else to help you and hold you accountable, that's okay too. Have somebody remind you of it, okay? Think different, be different, right? That will get you different results in life. Usually in, what I mean by that is better results in life, all right? So I hope that you guys enjoyed this lecture. I hope that it made you think a little differently. Maybe just add another tool to your toolbox to get to that next level, all right? Because I, for me, had to change a little bit about what I was doing four or five months ago. And you know what, guys? I'm not, knock on wood, knock on my head, all right? I'm still at like three down days in the last four months. It's ridiculous. Like, it's ridiculous, okay? By giving them more room, adding back, understanding that we need a little bit more flexibility in our trading. All right. So I hope that lecture was helpful to you guys. I'm Jared Wesley of Live Traders. We'll get back at it again next week.